I think that's us. Um, if there's a, I'll leave the door open for a minute, but if there's too much noise, if somebody could close it if it gets too noisy out there. Okay, um, my name's Alan Cantle, and uh, I'm, I'm CTO and founder of, of Nalatech, and I'm gonna be presenting uh, with, with Marcy Byers, who's in processor development, uh, processor development, sorry, at IBM. Um, and we're gonna talk about accelerating flash memory uh, with, with the high performance, low latency, open CAPI uh, interface bus. And I want to emphasize flash memory as opposed to flash storage. We are really looking at the flash as a, as a memory subsystem here, and that's the intent. Obviously, we can layer storage on top as well, so that's not, that's not a problem, but it's, it's very much a memory-centric a memory -centric perspective that we're looking at this on. By that, you mean the semantic or the persistence? Persistence, uh, persistent memory, yeah. So just a quick uh, just a, just a quick bit about Nalatech. Um, we've been in the in the FPJ acceleration uh, area for, for for over 25 years now, surprisingly, showing my age, and um, uh, and basically we have a, a good number of uh, very very good volume deployments uh, in partnership with a number of the server companies. In fact, pretty much most of them um, over the, over those over those years. So, so we're, we're very seasoned in FPG acceleration and we're a good trusted partner in that area with, uh, with deep, with deep uh, uh, technology and skills. So what I wanted to start with was really is um, the, the, the buzzwords, and we've heard them a number of times already in this conference, is the hyperconvergence hyper versus disaggregation. In, in, a, in really a true sense, they're really quite an oxymoron this, as far as I can see it. So the question we're, uh, I'm really, we're really asking here is can we hyperconverge and disaggregate uh, flash memory uh, at the same time and, and actually get the benefits of both. And um, so just touching on, on, on what that actually means, hyper, hyperconverged architectures is really, a, as I see it anyway, as a CPU-centric playbook. We're trying to get the best single-threaded performance. That's one of the, the, the critical areas where, where, where you want to get that and keep the single-thread performance out of acceleration. And really, uh, that you want the tightest of CPU and accelerator coupling uh, in, in order to achieve that with the holy grail of infinite bandwidth and zero latency. Maybe we'll get there sometime. <laughs> um, and, and really that does also play nicely into easier acceleration of legacy code. It's, it's the easiest way to get some good acceleration if you've really got a tightly coupled accelerator. Um, but uh, there's, there's much more to be had in more complex ways. Um, but but there's, there's always been a desire of this, this um, single thread acceleration. Um, there are also some subtopics around that area of lo le like latency out, out to uh, things like high frequency trading is a special one in, in the finance industry. Um, PCI is really today's convergence bus and uh, we've just seen the SSDs move to NVMe, so basically on the PCI bus and the tremendous benefits that that's actually brought. So that's really sort of the, the, the convergence bus of today. From on, on a disaggregated architecture perspective, we're looking at a data-centric playbook and a heterogeneous um, and distributed computing really uh, leverages, um, can leverage a disaggregated architecture much, much more effectively. Um, it, the, the idea here is you want to prioritize your application data flow needs, and that disaggregation allows you to do that. And you can put, con and, and, but the, the, the challenge there that comes with that is you actually put the congestion back into the network. So we are really overloading those networks as we go into more, uh, into these disaggregated architectures. Latency is inevitably larger on these and it's, it, it needs to be managed. Um, but really one of the solutions in a, in a distributed heterogeneous compute system is you move the compute to the data. So Ethernet is really today's disaggregation fabric and NVMe over fabric is obviously beginning to, beginning to get some traction for that. Um, so just looking at hyperconverged acceleration is a quest for infinite memory and zero bandwidth. Just to really highlight, moving a single thread of data from the CPU, CPU to an accelerator does negate the acceleration benefit. And therefore, your acceleration has to be bigger than the overhead of the data movement into and from the accelerator. And one of the techniques is you partition the code if, it, if that's possible for minimum data movement and maximum acceleration. Just put pictorially, the, the good old example is legacy code. You've got a tiny little hotspot in a, in, a, in, a, in a huge program that is consuming the vast majority of your execution time. And the accelerator manages to reduce that down to a very small amount, ideally but you've got this data movement and that's where the bandwidth and latency impact really make all the difference. So um, now, 
the low-hanging fruit are those big hotspots, but in reality, you, you, you very often have a lot of small functions that could run well on the accelerator, and so you want to move those across to the accelerator, and that's really where the data movement becomes more critical. So this has been known for a long time. So long, <laughs> hyperconverged, tightly coupled FPGA accelerators are not new. Uh, Intel, Xilinx, Nalatech, and ISI, Interconnect Systems, we all collaborated on the front side bus and QPI accelerators for a good while, starting back over a decade ago in 2007. Despite a decade of these ongoing efforts, though, commercial reality has been elusive. We've, we've really, and you know, uh, we spend a lot of money on this. Uh, if, if you look on the left-hand side, that's the, that's the six FPGA Vertex 5 stack from Xilinx. The Nalatech built, uh, it plugs directly into, the Z, into one of the Xeon sockets on a four sockets Intel server. And on the right is Intel, one of Intel's summary slides of, 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 where, uh, of where tightly coupled accelerators um, uh, apply. And that was, that was a 2007 presentation. So it's been tried for a long time. Why are tightly coupled accelerators so challenging then? Well, really, you are tied to a very complex proprietary coherent bus that typically has rapid cadence of the bus standards. It has limited interface documentation and can sometimes have onerous licensing terms. Um, and coherent buses are not really natively designed for, with FPGAs in mind. Um, they're designed for communicating between processors. So that pushes the limits of the FPGA um, uh, cons uh, capabilities considerably. And, the, and, and also, you get a heavy burden on the FPJ resources when you, with the IP trying to act as the home agent inside the FPJ. So that impacts performance, in particular latency, and it reduces your resources that are available for acceleration. And finally, you can actually also potentially drag down the, the processor's CPU to CPU uh, performance over, over the same bus. So I'd like to say that OpenCAPI really does address these issues. Uh, right across the board, in my opinion, and I'd like to hand over to Marcy, where she'll give you some more details on OpenCAPI. Okay, thanks, Alan. So let's start with the name, CAPI. It stands for a Coherent Accelerator Processor Interface. It's an open interface architecture that really allows you to connect any microprocessor to a wide variety of devices, whether they be uh, GPUs for acceleration, uh, memory, storage, network. OpenCAPI is agnostic to the processor architecture. So it's not tightly coupled to the IBM power processor. It can certainly be used by other companies for solutions in AMD or ARM um, processors. It was designed to be a high bandwidth, low latency interface at 25 gig. Uh, it's a by eight. And it really tightly couples the FPGA to the host microprocessor. And this is really important for us to achieve that low latency and high bandwidth. The attached devices are coherent and they operate natively within the, the application's user space. They use virtual addressing, which is key because it eliminates the overhead of device drivers as well as kernels. And it really allows for more accelerator performance as well as an easier um, integration of that accelerator into your application. We have a wide variety of use cases and support a ton of different form factors, uh, such as ASICs, FPGAs, GPUs, and a wide variety of memory. The OpenCAPI device itself can have device memory that becomes effectively system memory because it is coherent. And we also are architected to support both emerging storage class memories as well as Azure Classic memory solutions. And, and these would be coherent to the host microprocessor as well. What kind of memory paradigms are we looking to, uh, uh, looking to affect here? So we've got your basic DRAM attach. We can do this with very low latency. So we're thinking about a five nanosecond adder on top of native direct connect. We also can support storage class memory over that same exact processor interface. And the advantage here is that you still have load store access to that memory. You can have a mix of memory in your system, so you can have some direct attach and some storage class memory. Um, again, with very low latency. We also believe that there's a value to some tiered memory approaches. And here you can have you know, DRAM talking to storage class memory. So you could build a cache of your DDR memory and really have a, a huge set of storage class memory hanging off that that you're creating a transparent paging model for. 
All three of these are, are very important scenarios, and OpenCAPI addresses them all because of its focus towards low latency. We went over to the accelerator world. We've got a bunch of different paradigms here that OpenCAPI certainly plays well into. First example is your basic offload. So if you're looking at, you know, your GPU offload would certainly be an example here where you want to move the compute heavy functions of your workload over to the GPU while still allowing your CPU to do the sequential code processing. We've got the egress transform, where you're processing the data as it's leaving the system. So here, if you're moving a lot of data out to storage and you need to compress it, or maybe that data is sensitive and you need to encrypt it before sending it to its destination, flip side of that would be the ingress transform. Um, think about your service provider having your favorite television show, a uh, high quality version of that, and they need to use some kind of video compression uh, encoding in order to be able to stream that over to you. High frequency trading would be another example here where their proprietary complex algorithms are running on real time incoming data that they need to make those split second trade decisions. Needle in a haystack. In this scenario, you've got terabytes of data, maybe it's structured, maybe it's not, and you really want to run you know, advanced queries and, and searches and send a very small subset of that data over to your processor. And we're talking omegabytes versus the terabytes of data that you've got in your, in your uh, pile of off to the side. The final scenario would be the bi-directional transform. And here you can have a custom accelerator working on the egress data and a separate custom accelerator working on the ingress data. OpenCAPI supports all of these and it does it well because it allows you to really put the acceleration where it belongs, close to the data. And it's able to do this because of its open, lightweight architecture with focus on latency and bandwidth. The OpenCAPI stack is very similar to PCIe. The main difference, though, is that each of the layers are, are a lot, lot thinner. All OpenCAPI consortium members have access to the RTL and design specifications for both the transport layer, the TLX, and the data link layer, the DLX, that would sit on the OpenCAPI device. These were designed to operate at 400 megahertz, and they're asymmetric to the TL and DL layers that would sit on the host silicon. They are lightweight, and they make efficient use of the FPGA. As you can see here, you have most of your LUTs and block RAM available for your accelerator design. We take up very little space on these Xilinx FPGAs, um, and that's across the board. So the bottom chart, bottom table is showing various Vertex and Kintex um, Xilinx FPGAs that our Open Partner Consortium members are using for their OpenCAPI device solutions. I've talked a lot about low latency, high bandwidth design. What's key here is we have product available. So we have real bandwidth numbers, real latency numbers to show you. And I think it's important to kind of give you a history because we've really learned from CAPI 1.0 and 2.0 as we went and designed CAPI 3.0. CAPI 1.0 was on the Power 8 processor. It tunneled through PCIe Gen 3. CAPI 2.0 was on the Power 9 processor and it tunneled through PCIe Gen 4. Uh, but the bandwidths and the latency numbers that PCI limited us to really couldn't, couldn't drive all of the paradigms I talked about earlier. So we set out and said, okay, we need a clean slate. Let's use a dedicated 25 gig link. And let's really focus on minimizing the overhead in the protocol to maximize our bandwidth. And you can see here, we were able to achieve over 90% of that encoded link bandwidth. Uh, the other 8 to 9% really is accounted for by headers and CRC. This is really the tip of the iceberg, though, because moving on to future generations, you know, we're going to continue scaling this link speed up 32 gig, 50 gig plus um, types of things, and those are in, are in development today. As far as latency, we really wanted to kind of show you an apples to apples type comparison here. So we did, uh, we did a simple workload test on both OpenCAPI devices as well as PCIe. We took a 512 byte. Um, data from the cache and moved it down into the FPGA. Once all four cache lines were received by the FPGA, it responded with a 128-byte DMA write, and this, we just kept this looping, right? Uh, we used protocol, we used our, pro, our power bus traces as well as uh, protocol analyzers in it to take the measurements. And this chart's a little busy, but I really want to focus you on these top numbers. So the round trip latency for the Power9 Open Capi solution was 378 nanoseconds. That is half the latency of the PCIe Gen 3 solution. 
The other part that I want to point out, there's very little jitter with that. So applications such as high frequency trading that, that need those dependable results are going to get them. As well as you can see here that the stack is very thin. We have an 80 second na nanosec we have 80 nanoseconds of latency through the TLX and DLX on the, on the open CAPI device in comparison to the 200 to 400 nanoseconds that the typical PCIe HIPs have. I think the proof's in the numbers, right? We, we, we set out to design our low latency, high bandwidth um, interface, and, and that's what we've really got. And we're just going to continue to build on that. And with the number of use cases out there and our partners in the consortium, we're really looking forward to the various solutions that can come out of this. So I'm going to kind of turn it back over to Alan at this point. Thanks, Marcy. So really just re-emphasizing what Marcy just said there. Um, we've been working, you know, this is CAPI 3.0 really. So Open CAPI is the first uh, open, uh, open CAPI version over its native bus, but we've had previous generations over PCIe. And Nanotech's been working with, uh, with, uh, with the CAPI standards right from the, right from the beginning in 2014. We had, um, we had our initial card based on an ulterior FPGA that was uh, bridging a, a CAPI across to a fiber channel to connect to an IBM flash drawer. But that was a very large flash drawer, so we found a, a use case where we're really uh, uh, something of a smaller order of around about two or four terabytes. Uh, so we, we introduced a flash GT with, with self-contained flash in a, in a, in a, in a nick size card, and that was in 2016. We've now recently released last year um, both a cabled and an M.2 uh, NVMe version of the Flash ET and it's called the Flash ET Plus on Power 9 in, and over PCI Gen 4. And I'm going to give you a little bit more detail on this Open Capi one, this Flash Storage Accelerator that our, our parent Molex ASG uh, Applied Solutions Group has actually pulled together. Um, and, and, and just to say, we're also continuing on more standard form factors. Um, uh, uh, leveraging off of, um, off of what we've done with Molex ASG. So, so switching over to um, our, our data-centric world, uh, we, we touched on the hyperconvergence of OpenCAPI um, for the CPU-centric world, tightly cupping us, but it can also provide a fantastic bridge to the data-centric world. Um, so just, uh, just to um, maybe just to reiterate what you all know, data-centric architectures, I boil it down to three fundamental principles. Whenever I'm architecting a, a new system or a, new, a solution for a customer, this is what it comes down to. Is firstly, we want to consume zero power uh, when data is idle. That sounds obvious. <laughs> Two, don't move the data unless you absolutely have to. And three, if you have to move the data, you want to move it as absolutely as efficiently as possible. So, which really translates to use non-volatile, use persistent memory where possible, move the compute to the data where your, where your algorithm will allow you to move your compute to the data, and leverage independent power efficient data planes where that makes sense. So, looking at that architecturally, um, you know, data center, data center architectures, um, what we need to try and do is we need to try and blend the evolutionary with the revolutionary. And what I mean by that, when you've been doing acceleration for 25 years, <laughs> uh, one thing you learn over and over again is there's a ton of legacy code that's never going to go away. So you want to run that as performant and as efficiently as possible. And if you want to revolutionize the world and, and turn it into a data-centric world, you better not forget, you better not leave that, that CPU-centric capability behind because you're just going to not, not bring the world with you. So looking at this is a very simplified diagram of an existing data center infrastructure. You've got your CPUs and your fundamental memory and your, your top of rack network um, is all I'm really trying to show there. Uh, oops, sorry, wrong direction. And if you want to add acceleration, as we've just touched on with the hyperconverged, a CPU-centric acceleration, it's all about that tight coupling. And so you, you can add the FPGA accelerators and, and, and actually get, get this CPU-centric acceleration of your single-threaded data quite effectively. But then when you start to look at the um, emerging data-centric enhancements that you can do and really focusing on that, you want the storage, you want the persistent memory to be at the heart of, of, your, of your architecture. So, and the FPGAs are really data-centric processors from the get-go, from 25 years ago. They, you, you build compute engines around the flowing data. 
Um, so, so attaching the storage class memory or the flash to directly to the, to, to the FPGA where you can operate on that, uh, that flash in a very low latency fashion where the accelerator can help is, is great. And having that low latency connection to the CPU uh, only adds to that for, for hyper-converged uh, storage to the, to the CPU. But then you add a separate data plane. And I've, I've characterized the ideal separate data plane as zero power, high bandwidth, for low latency, non-coherent. Coherence is not, not needed on these planes. Streaming data plane. Now, Gen Z uh, is, 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 a, is, a, is a nice, it's a memory-centric uh, fabric. So it's a, it's a nice example to use for this, but it, you're not necessarily limited to just Gen Z. But that's one that we're, we're, we're investigating. Now, those of you that are familiar with the Microsoft Catapult and Azure architecture will probably recognize this straight away. And um, Microsoft kindly uh, acknowledged Nalatec actually in their, in, in their first paper. We, we built a similar system uh, with Edinburgh Parallel Computing Center in, in Edinburgh. Um, many years ago. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so this, this architecture is, is how I see it. The main difference between this and the Microsoft architecture is Microsoft reconverged the, uh, the control plane and the data plane onto the one top of rack network. I think there are tremendous benefits um, to, 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 to keeping those, 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 those uh, planes separate. separate. And uh, you, can, you can drive lower power. You can also drive different models where networking is great for networking, but when you look at it from a compute perspective, often there, are, there, there may be some different characteristics that you want to leverage, and having a separate data plane will give you that ability. So turning that into a physical product, with, with OCP, we, we had the, the, the really great advantage of being able to le leverage Google in Rackspace's Zaius um, Barrelite G2 platform. Um, uh, where, where, where they'd already built the, uh, the processor architecture. So again, I've shown it below, below the line. Is basically that block diagram there below the line shows you the, the, the basic Zaius and Barrelli architecture. And then we've, we're adding this reconfigurable fabric on top. So there's four, there's four open CAPI ports in this particular platform. That gives us a, a peak bandwidth of 200 gigabytes per second. And then ideally, we want to complement that with a equal bandwidth from the storage and out to the data plane as well. And we've still got the, as you see, we've still got the top of rack network there as, as well. So, sorry, is there anything else? Um, what's that? So here's, here's the physical picture of the, of the box. It, you can see it on the open Cappy booth um, outside if you'd like to go and see it. Um, I'll, I'll just pick up the card. The card that's actually sitting inside here is, is this particular card. So it's got a, a Zinc FPGA from Xilinx on it. We've got eight channels of M.2 NVMe. They're really provided, it's oversubscribed peak-wise, but giving you pretty much a sustained persistent read bandwidth that will saturate the, uh, the, the open CAPI channel. Um, and you've got the ability with the acceleration, you've got local memory here as well for, for, um, for, for caching that, that, that flash as well where necessary and for the acceleration. Um, there's four of those in, in, in the actual barrel -like platform, one per open CAPI port. And you've got, a, as, as I said, you've got a net uh, 200 gigabytes per second peak uh, in, all, in all directions on the data plane side. And that's just a block diagram of the architecture there that I won't go into too much detail on. So in summary, I um, really want to just say the Open CAPI interface standard is a perfect complement to the OCP initiative, bringing best, class, best in class uh, features including coherency, low latency, highest bandwidth. It's an open standard. And it's a perfect bridge to blend the CPU-centric CPU and data-centric uh, world uh, architectures out there. Um, we simultaneously, we, we, and we have shown here that simul you can simultaneously get hyper-converged and dis disaggregatable flash memory solutions that can be built without a performance compromise. So it's, you, you, know, you, you tend to have to make a compromise if you go one way or the other. OCP, OpenCAPI, and FPGA acceleration are really now bringing highly optimized data-centric server architectures closer to reality. So thanks very much. Um, I'll take any questions. We'll take any questions. Uh, I have a quick one. So the, the chart that showed a sort of protocol overhead of 298 nanoseconds, how does that square with the, the five nanoseconds or floor for If I'm understanding the, the sort of top arrow, 290 nanoseconds, that's it's strictly the processor. That's strictly yes. the Thank you. Yeah, I was just trying to yeah, understand this one, think a little bit more. Okay. So the bottom part is what's going on on the accelerator. The top part is the processor. Yep, so the links are in the middle, right? So you've got your PCIe link and your OpenCAPI link. So everything 
on the bottom half is your, your device, so your protocol stack into your accelerator unit. And, and so if you were just pulling a bit um, on your, your, your work processor and a bit that was on the, the accelerator, that could, that 298 could go as low as five? No, no, no. The, the piece on the bottom, we, with DDR, you're able to take some of the non-deterministic latencies, right? And take advantage of some of that, right? So there's some tricks you're going to have to play in order to get that latency down. Um, this was this test was specific to those those packet sizes doing, you know, that looping. Right. Yeah, the, the 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 five nanosecond one. So this is so on the on the open CAPI version, you see they've got. Um, uh, it's the 80 nanoseconds there, just uh, there, and that's the that's that's the latency inside the FPGA. That number there, mm -hmm. okay. So that's an FPGA path. I think the five you quoted is when you get to a an ASICized buffer. So the, there's yep. the, the FPGA obviously has uh, the soft logic, which which uh, has a bit of an impact there. The which one? Yep. But it's pretty good on the FPJ as well, <laughs> and and the resources is a big one uh, the, the, because typically twenty five percent of the FPJ in the in, in the old old ways. So so, so we're down under the five, cap engine right, so. is focused on doing all the heavy lifting in the processor, so you can leverage the FPJ's abilities to to its best. To, to what? Yeah, so it's the adder to the flash access. So uh, I would, to give you an example, we've been in parallel DDR for free for forever, and we keep saying we're going to go transceiverize. Micron tried to do it with HMC, um, but we're going to do DDR5 in parallel as well. That's all about that latency to that DRAM, which is, you know, the DRAM's roughly a TRC of 100 nanoseconds or thereabouts. And you know the, our, our, the, the transceivers have always added a little bit of overhead that's just too too much to handle. Meanwhile, storage SATA went transceiverized a decade ago. Now, but now we're seeing trans storage and memory converge into this into into all being memory and a persistent memory. The storage is so much longer latency anyway that it really makes sense to get into a transceiver world completely with persistent memory and also bring that DRAM into that transceiver world. And again, this is where OpenCAPI is focused on that, that transceiver that adder is, is, is significant for DRAM, but pretty insignificant for, for flash. So, but, but you've got the accelerator in there as well. So the communication with the accelerated functions, you want that tight coupling for those accelerated functions. So it's, it's bringing that, that, that you know, NVMe over fabrics is, is, you know, is, is more of a challenge because you're coming over Ethernet, you're going over TCP, you've got to deal with uh, failures um, and recoveries, whereas the hyperconverged is you know, your, your, your NVMe straight on that PCI bus. So we're just, we're just improving that, um, that, that, that the NVMe benefits that we've already seen going from SAS and SAS to NVMe. Thanks, guys.